I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and today we're reviewing the new Land Rover Defender 90. The new Land Rover Defender 90 is the short wheelbase version of the second generation Defender. It sounds hard to believe, but this really is only the second iteration ever of this classic nameplate the first generation car launched way back more than 70 years ago. It was a genuinely agricultural basic vehicle used during the war. The Queen was a mechanic on the original Defender and the Land Rover Parenti version of the Defender was a staple of our Australian army fleet here in Australia. I think it's safe to say that the new Defender might be a little bit more complicated for that use because under the skin, this is much more like a luxury car than the first Defender ever was. In fact, most people that own the first Defender would probably readily admit that they have to pretend to be comfortable as they're getting down the road. As we'll see when we take this Defender 90 P400X out and about though, we'll see it is a genuinely premium vehicle. The interior is full of rich English cowhide upholstery. It runs on air suspension. It has a three litre inline six cylinder engine producing 294 kilowatts of power. Not exactly basic transport, but I think we can all agree it looks pretty cool in short wheelbase 90 form. The 110 wagon is enormous, you know, as big as a Range Rover Sport. And so it's a little cumbersome. If your parking spot at home, if you live in the inner city is you know, it's a lot more compact. The 90 will suit those dimensions much more easily. But has the shortened wheelbase compromised the ride and handling? We'll find out in today's video when we take the new Defender 90 on road and off. But as always, we'll start inside. So before we make a start on that, you can hit subscribe down below the video. This particular Defender 90 is really a best of breed example. It's a P400X sitting at the top of the tree, at least until the V8 version arrives, uh, which I don't believe has been confirmed for Australia yet, but we're hoping that it will come here. For now, this is the top engine in the top specification, and that's why the car looks particularly cool outside and in. I personally think the combination of Hakuba Silver with the black bonnet, black metal detailing, and the 20 inch twin spoke wheels look pretty cool. You can let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. I'm also, of course, a big fan of this vintage tan interior, uh, which is two-tone with some black detailing, some open pore wood down here as well. And there's also some cloth detailing on the sides and the underside of the seat. So texturally, this interior is really lovely. That also extends to the steering wheel, which is pretty big, stitch leather hub, but it also has real metal trim on it. So it's quite a delight for the sensors sitting in this car, touching all of the surfaces. But it brings me back to that point that there's absolutely no avoiding the fact the Defender is a luxury car nowadays. It's no longer that rough and ready farm vehicle that it once was. Of course, if you have unlimited resources, you can certainly dedicate this to being a rough and ready farm vehicle. It's just that your super high quality perforated heated and cooled leather seats with significant adjustment on both sides will need, you know, a little bit more maintenance. Of course, you can buy the Defender in more basic trims, and I actually think that's how it's most charming. You never really lose these high quality materials or that sense of premium refinement, but I do think the uh, more introductory trims, particularly the one on the steel wheels, just looks so cool in heritage green. And you can let me know what you think of that proposition down below. Now, the design of the interior is very industrial, very cool. So we've got loads of storage, big open storage all across the dash, in the doors, down here in the center console as well. This car has the optional fridge and wireless charging pack, which is about two grand. It's also got optional three zone climate uh, and privacy glass, which you pay a bit more for, but otherwise everything is included. We've got this widescreen Pivi Pro infotainment here. The screen itself really neatly integrated probably a little on the small side, smaller than some other JLR screens now. But we have a fully digital instrument cluster, which is really bright and easy to read. There is CarPlay and Android Auto, but you've got to plug in your phone, which is a little inconvenient. But there's heaps of USB ports, including new USB-C type, but also the old stuff as well. Meridian sound system is really punchy, heavy on the bass, if that's your thing. And you've got controls here for your off-roading modes, climate, all kind of mixed into one. So you've got to tap through different cycles of these dials to get into the space that you want. Physical shifter here for the eight speed auto and the materials all soft, all really lush throughout the Defender. And the seat itself 
is high set, you've got a great view across the bonnet, it's supportive and comfortable, and we'll put a little view of the rear seats in here, but it's worth keeping in mind that if you're gonna be regularly using the back seats, the Defender 110 with five doors makes a lot more sense. When the Defender 90 was revealed in this new second gen form, I found it a bit difficult to gauge the size from photos, but it really is quite small, 4.3 meters in length, so really only as long as something like a Mazda CX-3, and about a meter shorter than the Defender 110 wagon, which is actually huge. The Defender 110 is bigger than it looks in photos, and it's really no shorter than its bigger Land Rover and Range Rover siblings. It's significantly longer than Toyota Land Cruiser 200 series. Cutting out a meter of the length does of course mean the boot space really suffers. Now with this one, I do have the second row in place. So we've still got five seats of capacity in this Defender 90. But as you can see, if you do that, your boot space is absolutely tiny. I've got the trusty Chasing Cars suitcases here. As you'll see, medium and small and the space is basically done. But of course we do have the ability to take those back out and drop the rear seats, which, which then kind of gets stuck on the front seats if you have a normal driving position. But as you can see, you have this kind of gap in the floor here, but the ability to push those seats forward and fit quite a lot more stuff in. The boot is really hardy though. You'll be able to hose this out nice and easily. You've also got controls for the air suspension so you can lower the rear of the Defender so you're not having to lift heavy stuff up so high. This car being the X, uh, which is kind of the full fat version of the Defender 90, we've also got a really cool feature back here which is an inbuilt air compressor with a hose packaged along with it. So you can pump up your own tires, uh, let them down when you're off-roading, in an entirely self-sufficient way. You don't have to have an auxiliary air compressor and faffing about with 12 volt sockets and stuff. It's already right here in the car and that is pretty tidy. So, clearly if boot space is the main concern, the Defender 110 will suit you more, but if you're only rarely gonna be needing that cargo space, the 90 is gonna suit most people. So what's it gonna cost you to run a Land Rover Defender? Well, it really depends on which engine you choose because of course that's gonna impact your servicing prices and your fuel consumption. The one I've brought along here is kind of the full fat Defender 90 with the P400 engine. That's a three liter straight six turbocharged petrol with a 48 volt mild hybrid system. And it does use a fair amount of petrol in town, it's gonna to use 13, 14 liters per 100 Ks, but on the open road, it is a more manageable sort of 10 liters per 100 Ks. So if you want maximum petrol fed performance in the Defender, this is as fast as you can go for now. 294 kilowatts of power is hardly lacking. But if you're looking for something a little bit more balanced, more frugal and also with more torque. You can get a six cylinder diesel in this car, which is a really nice engine and well suited to the Defender platform, in my opinion. Now servicing for this P400 over the first five years and 102,000 kilometers, it's gonna set you back $2,250 if you buy an upfront Land Rover servicing plan. In terms of insurance, in the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer spent $1,528 to comprehensively insure a new Land Rover Defender. Of course, everybody's situation varies and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account, like where you live, who drives the car, your driving history, etc. And the warranty on the Defender is five years with unlimited kilometers. So while we've discovered that the new Defender 90 is actually something of a luxury car, a kind of boxy baby Range Rover, at least in this X trim that sits at the top of the tree, of course, what this vehicle is designed for the entire intent behind it is off-roading and so that's where i'm going to start our drive today because while i think if we're honest with ourselves a lot of the clientele of a 145 000 ish dollar defender 90 will probably never bring their rig out onto the tracks which is a shame it's nice to know that it can and so you know, as part of our validation of, of cars when we review them, we need to make sure that they can live up to their claims. Now, I'm not the world's most skilled off-roader. I'm okay, I'm, you know, engaged with it, I'm interested in it, but I don't do it every single weekend. And interestingly, the Defender 
the new defender then is, is absolutely perfect for me because ensconced here in this beautiful cabin, the technology really takes a lot of the guesswork out of off-roading now. Uh, we've already touched on the compressor in the boot, which is great, so you can let your tires down without having to worry that you know you need to remember to bring a separate compressor along without any of that faff. But then we have Land Rover's latest terrain response system here in the Defender. It's a matter of twirling a couple of knobs, selecting the terrain that you can see in front of your eyes, in this case grass, gravel, snow, and using the crazy camera systems just to walk over that terrain. Of course, technology can only get you so far, and you can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you rely too heavily upon it. And so there's still a physical mechanical package here in the Defender 90 that is designed to get the job done without any of that stuff. And it starts with a really disciplined design uh, with short overhangs, so you're less likely to catch it on obstacles, or catch it as you're breaking over obstacles out here. It then transitions to an air suspension system, which is standard on the Defender, uh, which is really quite something. Uh, the highest settings are really high, and that's what enables a Defender's 900 millimeter maximum weighting depth. But it also means you can get your clearance nice and high just for general off-roading before even going into the realm of weighting forwards and whatnot. So it sits high, it's disciplined in terms of design. We are on Goodyear Wrangler all-terrain tires here, so we've got the right tire for the job. We've got 20 inch alloys on the X spec, but as you can see from having a look at the side of the car, the alloy isn't too big, uh, so we still have really decent sidewall, uh, but you can go for a smaller alloy and an even chunkier tire if you want to, and that's before you start touching anything aftermarket as well. We've got locking front and rear differentials, and the technology can take care of all of that for you. And then we've got plenty of protection around and under the body as well to just help keep the scuffs off the bodywork and the Juco. So I suppose the combination of the mechanical and the technological in the Defender 90 really does make casual weekend off-roading very, very easy. And then of course, if you want to base your serious off-roading rig on the new Defender 90, then you can, you can take it pretty darn far. Out of the box, it's highly capable, but of course the list of modifications that you can make are almost endless. But you do then end up with a very expensive off-roader and I do sort of mentally keep coming back to the idea that you could have almost five Suzuki Jimnys for the price of this rather posh Defender 90. But that's not really the point because I don't think many people who are interested in this car would actually consider a Jimny. Maybe if you really do kind of get into these small two-door, three-door off-roading wagons. But I think the price that Land Rover have pitched the new Defender at renders it a pretty premium product and really a style accessory for a lot of people but it is cool to get out here and to be able to you know say pretty conclusively that as an off-roading machine it's really quite something I did have an opportunity to extensively off-road the defender 110 when it launched here in australia and i think it was namibia or something the trip that uh, land rover did to validate the defenders before the international launch a couple of years back it's fairly well publicized so you know as a serious off-roading machine they do have the chops for it even if you never want to risk your own vehicle by coming out here you can be safe internally in the knowledge that if you had to you could well that being in the bag let's pump the tires back up and head back out onto the blacktop which is probably where the majority of these cars are going to be spending the vast majority of their lives so with a bit of off-roading squared away we're now back on the bitumen and we can have a chat about why the Defender 90 is actually quite special or really why the Land Rover Defender range now is quite special because the bandwidth of this vehicle is pretty much unparalleled. I mean the serious non-poser versions of the Mercedes G-Wagon or G-Class are certainly in the same league. Uh, and vehicles like the Jeep Wrangler are also in a 
a lesser league, but they sort of aspire to this level of bandwidth that the Defender absolutely nails. And that's that, it's perfectly comfortable and perfectly drivable on the road, but then it can pull off real feats off-road. And the sort of compromises that are generally required in order to make a vehicle seriously competent off-road normally renders them absolutely horrible to drive on the road. Uh, and we see that with most dual cabs um, here in Australia, which are very, very popular vehicles. They're designed to be used on rugged trails of Southeast Asia and off-road here in Australia. And as such, they're usually a dog's breakfast on the road or you know, as close as possible to a dog's breakfast. Now, the Defender might be very expensive, <laughs> And it is, but you can see where a lot of that money was spent in bringing that compromise right back and engineering a suspension in particular, uh, which can articulate to a very substantial degree off-road and yet still offers good body control and a settled demeanor here on the road. Now, the first thing I wanna say about the Defender 90's on-road dynamics though, is that it isn't as good to drive as the Defender 110. The Defender 110 is seriously very impressive. It's lush on the road. It actually makes you wanna drive it faster, harder, more sportily. Uh, it's a really, really good thing. A fantastic substitute for a Discovery or a Range Rover Sport or something. It's got really beautiful dynamics and planted handling. Now, with the Defender 90, it's pretty obvious from outside the vehicle that it's much smaller, and it is. It's, it's a metre shorter overall, but most importantly, the, the wheelbase is half a metre shorter than Defender 110, and when you shorten a vehicle's wheelbase to such an incredible extent as that, uh, it really does change the balance of the vehicle, both in the corners, but also on the straights. So, it's never terrible, and in fact the Defender 90 probably sets a new benchmark for how good a short wheelbase off-roader like this can be uh, on-road. It's pretty settled, it's just not in the same universe of plantedness as the 110 with its longer wheelbase. In any case, we'll come back to the ride and handling in a moment. First of all, let's start with the powertrain situation, uh, because like quite a few uh, Jaguar Land Rover products, the Defender lineup includes a lot of different engine choices. Now, the car I'm driving is a P400, which for now in Australia is the top spec petrol until the V8 arrives. And of course the V8 just should be a complete meme. It's incredibly expensive, it'll sound great, and of course everyone will want one. But for now the P400 is an interesting option. It's a three litre straight six petrol, producing 294 kilowatts of power and 550 newton meters of torque, which is heaps in a car like this. Uh, the Defender 90 with the P400 is downright quick in a straight line. It'll shock people uh, at the traffic light drag race with just how rapid it's able to be. The top speed isn't that high, it's like 191 k's an hour, and that's because it's just so bluff. But off the line, it's really good. It's also a really nice refined powertrain because it isn't diesel. So if I put my foot down, you know, we just get a low petrol six cylinder bellow. Really quite nice to listen to. Lots of torque. We've got a 48 volt system as well. So it plugs some of those torque holes. All in all, really, really drivable. Really easy to like with this engine. However, the fuel consumption is a little high. Um, I've done about 14 litres per 100 k's combined in my testing. It doesn't get that much better on the highway because we do have that sort of bluff front end. It does get a bit better, but you should expect around 14, 13, 14. However, I kind of think when you're dealing with a 294 kilowatt petrol six cylinder, that's not too bad, right? That's not too bad. That being said, if what you want is a more traditional Defender engine, I guess, uh, then you've got plenty of choice on the diesel side of the ledger. Uh, and there's a really nice D300, which is probably the engine that I would go for. Three litre diesel, in fact all of the diesels are three litre straight six units, just with various amounts of power. Uh, but the D300's really generous, suits the car really well in either 90 or 110 guys, so that's probably the way I would go. So, the ride and handling. Look, as I said at the very start, the Defender is all about being an off-roader first, and anything else second. 
but as an on-road machine, you know, it's pretty sorted. The steering is the main thing you're gonna notice as being calibrated particularly clearly for off-roading because the ratio is quite slow. And that means that you need to dial in more steering lock than usual in order to get a certain response from the front wheels. That effect is kind of exacerbated by the sheer size of the steering wheel. It's a pretty big steering wheel, so you find yourself kind of, you know, it's not like steering the bus or anything, but it's definitely a bigger wheel than, you know, other Jaguar Land Rover vehicles, or at least some other JLR vehicles. Of course, that slow steering rack is great for off-roading because you're not gonna add too much lock and stuff up your line. But on road, it makes it feel, I guess, a touch more agricultural. What's great though, is that the steering responses themselves are highly accurate, including on road and at high speed. So you can actually thread a line through a corner really easily in the Defender. At times you need a little bit of patience because this is a tall, short vehicle. So you can't drive it like a hot hatch, but you can kind of drive the Defender 110 like a hot hatch. That's sort of the difference between the two. With that extra wheelbase, extra security in the corners, the 110 is, the trustier vehicle on road, the 90 is totally fine. The ride, air suspension as I mentioned, it's a nice level, soft-ish ride, rounds off bumps really nicely on country roads, but in town it can be a little bit choppy with this short wheelbase. So I guess what I'm saying is if you want the look, if you want the particularly good off-roading ability, then the short wheelbase makes a lot of sense but for everybody else who's gonna be driving on the road a lot of the time and who wants easier access to the back seats and a bigger boot, the 110 with the long wheelbase makes more sense. So you can sort of choose your own adventure. Refinement is pretty good. The all-terrain tires can get a little noisy at highway speeds, but there's a lot of noise suppression here in the cabin. Comfort's good. It's kind of crazy, you know, bowling along off-roading with your cooled seat going. That's a nice feature in Australia. Not today, it's filthy weather today, as you can probably tell. Driving position, really nice. Command driving position. Good view out. And the safety systems are okay. We've got adaptive cruise. We've got all those cameras. We've got AEB. We don't have lane keep assist in this car, but the mirrors are big. We've got blind stop monitoring. All in all works pretty well and you certainly feel safer than you do in a Jeep Wrangler. So there's that. So those are my opinions on the new Land Rover Defender 90. There's absolutely no avoiding the fact that this is a cool car, but it's also a pretty major indulgence, particularly if you go for a highly specified version like this P400X. 150 grand is a lot to blow on any car, particularly one which isn't especially practical uh, like this short wheelbase Defender. That being said, if you're looking for a pretty epically styled off-roading capable vehicle like this Defender, you just must have one. I completely see the appeal and I could see myself driving one. However, I can also see myself driving a Suzuki Jimny, which you can get for about a fifth of the price. So that's another alternative to consider. You could also consider something like the new Mercedes-Benz G400D, uh, which is you know a similarly retro styled luxury option. You can let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. While you're there, make sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell. And as always, thanks for watching, Jason Cars.